Good morning and a very warm welcome to the opening plenary of the Livelihoods India Summit hosted by Access and co-hosted by Neeti Ayo, themed The Future of India's Livelihoods, Vision 2030. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the panel members for the session. We have Dr. Harsh Kumar Bhanwala. Dr. Bhanwala is the Executive Chairman of Capital India, an India-focused integrated financial services company since August 2020. Prior to joining Capital India Finance Limited, Dr. Bhanwala was the chairman of NABAD for six and a half years. We, have, we also have on panel Dr. Arvind Mayaram, vice chairman of the Chief Minister's Rajasthan Economic Transformation Council. Dr. Mayaram has earlier held the positions of Finance Secretary of India and Special Secretary in the Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India. Moderating the session is Mr. Vijay Mahajan, CEO of Rajiv Gandhi Foundation. With this, I hand over to uh, Mr. Vijay Mahajan to take forward the discussion. Thank you, Puja. I think you're on. Thank you, Puja. Uh, welcome, everybody. I believe there are over 500 people in the audience. Uh, sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, uh, there are <clears throat> uh, the previous session, those of you who are watching, uh, just got over about seven, eight minutes ago. Uh, the <clears throat> Uh, we were also supposed to be joined by Dr. Uh, Ratin Roy, but I think uh, he probably waited for a while and then uh, may have moved on. But we'll, I hope he will join us in the middle of the discussion. But in the meantime, let me welcome <coughs> uh, Dr. Arvind Mayaram and Dr. Harsh Bhanwana. <coughs> I, I share the distinction of having gone to the same school with Arvind and the same business school with the Harsh. So, so it's it's a coincidence uh, that I thought I should mention, uh, but uh, the fact is that between the two of them, they have spanned a lifetime of work. Uh, you know, in what constitutes livelihoods in India, uh, Harsh as a career banker, <clears throat> uh, most of his career in in Nabad, but also significantly in the Indian infrastructure. Uh, finance corporation he he has worked on the two fundamental sectors of the indian economy namely agriculture and uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, arvind in his career as a civil servant first in rajasthan where he led uh, the you know the transformation of rajasthan from uh, <clears throat> from one of the bimaru states to an industrial powerhouse uh, uh, of course, such large things can't be credited to only one person, but I can certainly say, having watched it from the sidelines, that Arvin played, played a central role in the team that made it happen. And if today Rajasthan is known for some of its most outstanding industrial clusters, uh, Arvin had a lot to do with it from his days during, the, uh, during his time as <clears throat> in Rajasthan. But then when he was in the union ministry, he's, uh, as he was introduced, he was uh, significantly in the financial sector. And uh, there he led a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the reforms which have led to investments, uh, both in the infrastructure, but also in the industrial, uh, the higher end industrial sectors. And uh, through that process contributed to the diversification and the, you know, significant <clears throat> sort of transformation of the Indian economy. I, I wanted to start with that just so that the audience knows that we are talking to two people who have uh, really been in the trenches. Uh, and if I may say so, so have I been, uh, you know, uh, although as a civil society wala running NGOs and uh, social enterprises. And therefore we will keep today's discussion uh, informed by policy but focused on practice. And the second thing that I would request both Arvind and Hirsch, and I'm sure they'll be delighted to do so, is to focus primarily on the future rather than, you know, lamenting the present or, you know, celebrating the past or, or deriding it. Uh, I think we need to learn our lessons from the past and move on, but let's focus on the future. In the previous session, I had, just finished presenting the State of India's Livelihood Report. And while we did talk a bit about what is the State of India's Livelihood in 2021, particularly, you know, in a difficult situation post-COVID, but our focus was 
on what is the trajectory to build inclusive livelihoods, livelihoods for all by 2030. And just to uh, <clears throat> give you an idea of what is the quantitative estimates, we need to generate roughly 12 crore new livelihoods in this decade if we are going to arrive in 2030 with roughly livelihoods for all. Even then, there'll be a 2 to 3% unemployment rate. And to do this, and Arvind, since you've been finance secretary, we need, uh, I have an estimate, and i am be happy if you'd look through it later. Uh, we need an investment of 120 lakh crores uh, in specific sectors and infrastructure. And that works out to roughly 60% of India's GDP, reduced GDP in 2020. And that needs to be done in the first six years of the decade if it has to make a difference by the end of the decade. So roughly we are talking of 20 lakh crores every year. Now that coincidentally is the same number that was declared during the COVID uh, period as uh, you know the Atman Nirbhar package. But 20 lakh crores is a tall order if you're asking the government to do it. The good news is that we are not asking the government for even a small fraction of this. We are saying that most of this will come through investments by households and by aggregated investments of households through the banking sector and the banking insurance and the other financial sector. I mean, we must remember that while we keep talking about capital market investments, 99% of the money in the capital market comes from household savings and a little bit from corporate savings. In fact, there's a lot of government dis savings. So the large contribution is the capital market is from household savings. And therefore, we need to remember that we, we are actually Atmanirva. Now we are formally Atmanirva, but financially we have been Atmanirva. Uh, international investment has been less than 1% to 2% in our GDP at any time. Uh, you know, of course, now FDI and FII has gone up, but since then. So with this, let me, with this introduction, let me begin by uh, asking uh, <clears throat> Harsh first, because A is for agriculture, uh, and uh, Arvind, I'll come next to you. But, you know, let's start with, you know, Harsh, this is a very difficult time for India's agriculture. And of course, all that is happening around Delhi we need not talk about it because it's being talked about on every channel and so forth. But as chairperson of NABAD, you've seen that Indian agriculture needs to undergo a second transformation. The first transformation happened, you know, in the late 60s, and early 70s, the so-called green revolution. We need a second green revolution, what Dr. Swaminathan calls uh, an evergreen revolution, you know, to move towards sustainability. In, both environmental and financial. What are your thoughts on that and what are the livelihood implications of that? Thank you, uh, with, uh, uh, Vijay. Harsh, uh, you're on mute, I think. Am I? No, I'm not on mute. No, I can hear you. Okay, uh, can you just increase the volume? Yeah. Uh, I'm Go ahead. Sorry. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have rightly mentioned, uh, we have seen a phase of uh, um, development in the agriculture sector in 60s and 70s, which uh, led to production, uh, um, large scale production, you know, the, the cereals going up, etc. So newer technologies, intensive agriculture, uh, mechanisms to support price, and uh, that has all happened. So today's status is uh, we have, we produce more than three, close to 300 million tons of cereals. Uh, more production is of horticulture produ produce. And uh, one of the highest growth rates in the livelihood, sec livelihood I mean, uh, this livestock sector within the agriculture sector. So uh, once we have large, we have produced, I mean, second largest or largest producer in several crops of the world. Uh, while uh, uh, the production uh, productivity would uh, continue to be focused on, we need to, fo I mean, equally focus on the market outreach. Uh, the, the way most of our produce reaches the markets, uh, the middlemen are quite large. Number two, sometimes the quality of produce that is available to the consumer is not in the form and in the quality 
uh, that he wants, which means value addition to agriculture. And also certain regions, uh, region of uh, sir, uh, contribution of certain regions, particularly the eastern, northeast. That's what Swaminathan just spoke. We have to go to newer areas. So it's newer regions, newer thrust on marketing, logistics, value chain processing, reducing spillages. So I would call it uh, a secondary agriculture. You know what we what the infrastructure we built on uh, for uh, a large scale production has to be reoriented now uh, to cater to newer demands. And for which I would say, Vijay, first of all, our agricultural departments in the states need to be reoriented totally. Look at the the skill sets available in the agriculture departments there. They are mostly entomology, pathology, production, seed, soil, all production oriented. We don't have an IT guy there in agriculture. We don't have a market segmentation guy there in agriculture. We don't have a GI guy there in, uh, in agriculture. We don't have uh, uh, probably the legal fellows to steal contracts. Yeah. We, are, we are talking in terms of number of FPOs being guided by the states. So can we not take it up? It's right time that some kind of a resource center on the newer requirements in agriculture, livelihood creation needs. That's the first thing which I would say. Next thing which I would say is, uh, uh, you rightly said, uh, uh, it cannot be just driven by the state. State is required everywhere, you know, law and order, you know, policy formulation, incentives, all that would continue to be required, but this would also require newer people to come in. You see, today, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the milk's success is on account of the people's movement, where the society's people came forward. Similarly, for uh, uh, NRLM, if you look at livelihood, one of the largest programs for livelihood. It is the self-help group movement which led uh, to ultimately uh, what NRLM is today and is, is aspiring to be in future. So for that purpose, even in the newer agriculture, the, the farmers and farmers groups will have to play a key role. I think we need more sociologists to come forward. We have, we have seen a PO movement in, in existence for some time, but for a larger breakthrough to have uh, to have happened or to happen in the future, I think we require plethora of social scientists, uh, the the developmental workers to come in, and you know we have seen many of them are not scaling up. And uh, for instance, uh, when I left Nabard in May, we had around four thousand FPOs promoted by Nabard, whereas the number was around seven thousand when uh, of the country as a whole, seven thousand five hundred various other entities involved as well. So I we found that A category and B rated A, B, C, D, B used to rate them were nearly thousand FPOs were A and B. Maybe the, 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 the period was uh, uh, not as much. Uh, it requires a, a longer period, uh, uh, I mean, uh, mentoring, uh, uh, nurturing, and cohesiveness of people. So I think we require a different set of peoples to support this, number one. At the central level, uh, at the state level, as well as uh, um, at the KBK level and others, and also within the FPO movement, probably there is some kind of an advice required. You can't have a distantly placed uh, facilitation center, maybe at commissionary level or district level. You know, you require some of them to play a key role in major FPOs. Second part, I would say, is within agriculture. I think uh, uh, I would say that uh, infrastructure for agriculture support for this kind of work is required. Uh, uh, I would still focus on agriculture uh, production in the form of larger availability of water. So uh, I think uh, we've, within, from Nabad when I was there, largest uh, micro irrigation fund came up and uh, the uh, also long-term irrigation fund for existing projects to carry on for, because this large, large area is semi-arid or arid. So I think we need to focus on those areas for uh, higher production. Uh, in addition, uh, food processing 
dairy processing you know during my time when i was the chairman we we talked to the ministry of government of india and we were able to uh, with their help and with their guidance we were able to create uh, the the livestock infrastructure fund also the dairy infrastructure investment in uh, dairy processing has not happened after 1980s 90s when the the uh, operation flood one was there but particularly in the cooperative sector i think it's time with the higher production so this entire infrastructure creation uh, you require funds uh, which would come from the government and also would come from the capital markets which you said uh, vijay very true from my side uh, i would uh, uh, no csr money comes in we have uh, 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 that's the uh, uh, contribution by the uh, the corporates but i would also say that uh, uh, newer mechanisms for uh, such support uh, to startups and to apos and to institutions engaged in this you know you require large scale mentors uh, when you have startups coming up each we have seen in uh, in tamil nadu agriculture university in hyderabad nam center producing excellent uh, incubators i am ahmedabad is producing one we have supported icr is supporting some other private entity is supporting so these incubators are working on uh, providing solutions to problems in agriculture i think there needs to be a greater philip uh, to this uh, sector you know uh, this is typical in the sense that uh, Uh, you know, uh, agri ag, ag techs take a longer uh, gestation periods to establish themselves rather than fintechs and others. Uh, typically, uh, the uh, other other startups take uh, and hurdle rate is also at times lower. So uh, I think uh, this requires. We have seen some funds coming in. One point nine billion dollars is the uh, which which has gone into the support to various ag tech startups in the last from two thousand five fourteen to nineteen. So we are seeing a scale up, a saying of crops, large scale uh, application of technology, drones, etc., satellites. We also require fintechs. We also require biotechs. Uh, we also require logistic value chains. I mean, um, uh, input side as well as uh, output side. So this would require uh, probably uh, some other mechanism, funding mechanisms also, Vijay. If you uh, allow me, I just say that uh, uh, we have seen stock exchanges uh, uh, there, but mostly uh, bigger entities take advantage of them, which are for-profit enterprises. So I think uh, there has been a talk of a social stock exchange now. I think social stock exchange uh, should uh, ensure that the NGOs or the larger non-profit entities engaged in livelihood creation in agriculture or in rural areas need to be covered, uh, and there should be a mechanism for them. to come on the platform where in small investors you know today we have also seen it uh, professionals we've seen new breed of uh, uh, wealthy people also who are educated who are uh, uh, professionals who want to give back so uh, we have seen i've seen number of my classmates uh, you would also know vijay and uh, sir you would also know uh, various people who have uh, achieve certain uh, who've done some mark up and um, achieve some landmark in their careers they want to give back to the society in in the form of finances as well not only just uh, rendering uh, uh, a non financial service i think uh, that kind of mechanism is very much required uh, we have seen different entities so i would i would come back to that in an in, in sure. a little later of what mechanism can come but uh, just just from the aspiration of livelihood seekers in rural areas i would like to say you see uh, you have rightly uh, said in your uh, this report i have gone through the uh, the major points you know manrega is a last resort when i don't have anything else we have seen in covid uh, then the, the 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 volume swell uh, in addition to manrega uh, i think uh, government jobs are not available that's uh, everybody's uh, uh, we require uh, transparency and fair play in the government uh, jobs availability in competition etc but uh, uh, by and large we need lots of other jobs to be created by people so this secondary agriculture uh, agripreneurs 
sons and daughters of the farmers and the rural people getting those getting involved in those ops you know up a chota sa example main deta hu ki micro irrigation if you do okay we don't find plumbers to fix uh, hand hand pumps today in rural areas so harsh i i may i come back to you in a second round yes. uh, and uh, let me you know the the point that you made uh, while introducing arvind one of the things i forgot to mention and I, it's important to what harsh you said is that arvind also led the thinking on the creation of the national skill development corporation and Uh, the national skill development corporation was not a corporation under the labor ministry it was under the finance ministry vijay can i comment for a minute for him you know uh, even agri investment when it was going down he was uh, secretary finance and economic affairs uh, secretary i had approached him for uh, subventing the long term uh, investments i think uh, it has taken off sir let me say that right so <laughs> so I mean, this is not to sing sing your praises, but to to really say that you know you've been involved with the real sector through the financial sector. So my opening question to you is that the big transformation that we need in India is to move forty five percent of those workers of India's workers who are in agriculture, producing only fifteen percent of the GDP. We need to bring this. in a reasonable period of time to maybe one third of the workers producing a quarter of the gdp you know so some of it would have to mean that workers would have to move from the agricultural sector to what harsh called the secondary agriculture sector but then even that is not enough to absorb so the one big question to you is is the industrial sector in a position to absorb and if not then what are the solutions what are the policy solutions can we do what china did which is to move 100 million people out of agriculture but not leave the village is it possible at all uh thank you vijay so first of two things uh before i answer your question first is uh i read the chapter that was sent to us that you wrote and i must commend you it's an outstanding chapter and uh, i also want to tell you i'm going to do a bit of cheating and i'm going to use it uh, as a resource for a lot of policy uh, thinking that we are doing for rajasthan government at the moment so thank you for contributing that chapter <clears throat> second uh, point that i'd like to make is that uh, you have spoken of uh, harsh and you have spoken about me but you have uh, i must tell you also that you have been very much in the middle keeping a uh, public policy grounded to reality through the work that you have done so your contribution also has been immense in public policy thank you now two things uh, first is uh, i think we have said three things and harsh also said he has a tremendous capacity to bring very large and i always find agriculture sector to be a little mind boggling because because it is not a sector in a uh, in a manner of speaking but it's a federation of sectors that comes together and it's difficult to put it together uh, in that sense and uh, harsh has done it quite well but i think we have spoken of three different things till now first is finding finance which actually should be the last but i am bringing it first because uh that is an area where i have some understanding uh the second part is that we are talking of livelihoods and how to find jobs or livelihoods for for young very young people as you have brought out in your in your uh chapter that india would have the largest period for uh for the dividend can you hear me because i seem to have lost hello video for everyone on this so that's why i don't know whether it's my problem or the problem is on the other side i'm back sorry there was some technical glitch sir can you hear us face is frozen sir i think there is some problem there arvin can you hear us Mr. Myram's uh, 
I can see his video, but not his, so can't hear him. <clears throat> Harsh, maybe till we get uh, Arvind back, yeah, sure. just, just continue with your point. Uh, I think uh, uh, you uh, uh, rightly mentioned uh, in your uh, this thing that uh, while we, we uh, look at uh, some of the things in past with uh, some satisfaction and some anxiety both, it is not fulfilled uh, the way we wanted it to be fulfilling. Uh, but uh, the the future uh, is uh, of livelihoods is very important. So I broadly covered sectors uh, 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 which I mentioned in rural areas will need focus. But I have something more to mention here, uh, Vijayji. I think uh, our natural resources in rural areas are getting depleted. Uh, soil is uh, uh, not as rejuvenating as it was earlier. Uh, then we have an issue with air quality, uh, particularly in North. And uh, then we have issues of uh, uh, climate uh, bothering us at many, many events. We have seen uh, large scale. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I just finished in a minute and then you can take over, sir. They asked me to fill up the sure. gap. Yeah, yeah. Please, please. Uh, also, uh, uh, in addition, water is depleting. So these three natural resources need to be conserved. And this offers openings for various livelihoods also. I would uh, just finish and I'll detail this later. I request uh, Arvind Mayaram sir to uh, continue his uh, deliberations. But this offers a lot of opportunities for livelihoods, Vijay. Uh, so we were mentioned, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, the three things that we I had mentioned. The first one, of course, is how do we find, find uh, so I'll come to the finance last, but the first part is how do we find livelihoods which are not purely in, grounded in agriculture. I think we have missed out on two as, as, in, as a country. Uh, and I think as a policy maker, as a, be, having been a part of policy maker, I think it has been a singular failure of, uh, of policy in India. That we have for the longest period of time looked at rural development and urban development as two different things altogether. And I think that has created a huge amount of dichotomy in the country. So whereas you find, and this is shown by migration also and by your report also, that earnings in the rural areas are much less for the same kind of job, with say informal sector, uh, job than it is in the urban areas and therefore you have huge migration from rural to urban but we have continued to make put a lot of focus on rural development in a manner as if it is different from what urban development is and this has been one of our major failures in the country in the last 70 years uh, i wish we had 20 30 40 years ago uh, obliterated this distinction and perhaps other results would have been very different. Now the effort was made uh, starting with Dr. Kalam's idea of Pura, which was provisioning of urban amenities in rural areas, which we had tried to refine and fine tune and projectize, which later became urban mission for this government. But it has really not that in the minds of the policy makers, this distinction has not gone away. Now, if we don't do that, as you have also shown, by 2030, 40% of the India's population get, has to become urban population. Do we have enough number of urban areas to absorb them? Because urbanization also results in non-farm jobs. When you talk about not finding a plumber for fixing a hand pump in the rural areas, the reason is because there is a demand for that person in the urban areas. And so they move to urban, the moment they are trained, and we have saw this also in the, uh, in the national skill development uh, mission that was launched uh, in the finance ministry, we saw the fact that more and more people who were trained in the rural areas would move to the cities once they had got skills because they could earn better and they wanted better life. I mean, everybody wants better life. They want their children to have better education. They want a better medical facilities. And there, these are not available in the rural areas. So first thing that we need to do as a, as a parad paradigm shift in our development strategy is 
to begin to look at creating more cities. We need to create more cities or more urban centers, which have the facilities which will prevent, which will slow down migration to large cities, which is happening at the moment. And the cities are becoming completely unwieldy and uh, are becoming very difficult to govern because they're becoming too large. I mean, look at the size of Delhi today. It is completely impossible to govern that city. So you, we need to do this, this um, strategy change has to happen if we want to create jobs in the non uh, agriculture sector. Now, one uh, uh, question which will arise, which we have also seen, if you look at the SDGs itself, say, uh, the, uh, the sustainable development goals that India is a signatory to, the kind of resource required to be able to only provide drinking water or you know sanitation and so on the amount of resource required is humongous it's it's a it's a great uh, you know re requirement for resources one thing we must remember and there is a bit of a divergence in that sense with the uh, harsh on this is that whereas we, csr funds and all these are important we social uh, you know contributions by people is important but when you look at the total requirement of resources, this becomes a very small part of it. So therefore, much of the heavy lifting has to be done by the government to get the economy moving in the direction in which we believe uh, it will be able to provide livelihoods to the young people. And much of this money then should also be leveraged to bring private investment in. But this private investment is not in terms of one of the things also, and Vijay would agree with me. I think it is a Gandhi or a hangover or in whatever manner we may look at it, but we have always seen that a profit making enterprise is seen with less respect than a non profit making enterprise. And therefore, we have always believed that CSR funds are superior to, uh, to investments which require profits. In my mind, that is another hang up that we'll have to give up. And we'll need to bring a lot more commercial money, as I'm, if I may use that term, commercial money into uh, infrastructure. Now we tried a lot, and uh, between uh, 2004, five, and uh, right up to now, there has been a tremendous amount of work which has gone into creating public-private partnership formats. Public-private pri partnership formats are where viability gap funding, for instance, is used to make those projects which are otherwise not commercially viable to become commercially viable and then private investment does come in we have seen that has come into uh, economic infrastructure but it has also moved into social infrastructure i can tell you an example of this is in rajasthan for instance we there was an attempt right with the public health centers to be run by private sector and i personally visited some of them of course, the experience is a mixed experience, but in some of those places, actually people did not know that it was not run by the government because it's a public health center. It's totally manned by the private sector. The, the medicines are provided by government, but distributed by the private sector. And people felt that the services were much superior. They in fact were giving credit that the government has been able to give good services. Government hospitals are becoming better not really looking at how the private sector had brought in these efficiencies and also some part of investment, but they were getting a return on it. Government was paying them. Now who pays is not an issue. When we talk of commercial format, it does not mean that the poor will have to pay, but commercial format means that the private sector does get a return on their investment. So it need not always be a civil society effort an NGO effort. You know, I mean, I'm not decrying that because that's a, tremendous amount of impact the civil societies can bring into this sector, but for different purposes. I find it difficult to believe that the civil society effort can actually create, uh, generate the kind of resource which is required to be able to bring this kind of infrastructure in. Now, two things, Dr. Ratin Roy is not here, but he has done some very interesting study, and I wish he was here with us, where he shows that we in our first revolution since 1991, which is the economic liberalization that we did, 
close to 150 million people are now into what is known as the consumer class and they're consuming. But this also is primarily the tax base, uh, which is both for direct and indirect taxes for the country. So our resources become constrained by the fact that much of the tax base is restricted to this 100, 150 million people. But this also means that we are getting into an early middle, middle uh, uh, you know, uh, income trap too early actually, uh, because rest of almost uh, close to a billion I mean, people, uh, 900 million people are yet not arrived in that scene. So what we need to do is to move. So, and the migration patterns are a good indication of where the investment has to go to create these jobs. So UP and Bihar, for instance, huge migration. Orissa, huge migration. West Bengal, huge, huge migration, which ties up with what Harsh has said that the second revolution has to come in the East. There, even if you reform agriculture, but we need to still do a huge amount of a non-agricultural investment, and that can only come in three ways. First is we need to do a huge amount of investment in there. So investment is both in roads, for instance, road transportation. So you open up new areas, remote areas with good quality roads so that they start getting linked up with the markets and they can, they get, they, they can you know, the more industry or agro-industrial activity can begin to happen along with the other you know, uh, value chain uh, activities, cold storages, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing that we need to do is also to rationalize the power sector. I think without doing that, we will not be able to move into any kind of uh, a higher level of you know, industrial activity or even economic growth. Today, the power sector is completely distorted and there has to be some sanity which we bring into it because without power, you cannot have industrial activity. So the second part is that we need to do power sector. And the third, but which is, in my opinion, most critical is we need to work towards, you know, uh, bringing down the political temperature, which has created huge amount of divisiveness in the society. Now, I'm not talking in time, I mean, at the moment, I'm not giving a political discourse. I'm talking purely economics. Economics is that if you have divisiveness, then the chances of political, of, of uh, social enemy or, or unrest is higher. And when there is social unrest, economic activity has, takes a beat. And therefore, the investors are wary of going into those countries or into those regions which do not have uh, what we would say law and order. And if you have all the time, you have uh, kidnappings, you have killings, you have lynchings, you have agitations, investment will not happen. So we need to bring that temperature down in the country to start off economic activity. And this is where I would think these three factors we have to deal with. Once we have these in those areas, and migration is a very good indicator from those areas which are the home uh, regions of the migrant labor and moving to the other areas where they find jobs, we need to begin to create industrial activity services, urbanization in areas from where people are migrating. So Thank this you, is something uh, that we need to look at. Let me come back to you in a second round, uh, but uh, thank you for making those very important points and some plain speaking. I think we do need a certain amount of, as you said so rightly, reduction in the political temperature before the, the social fabric of this country can be darned again and, you know, we can get on to the basic problem of livelihoods. Uh, and your <clears throat> emphasis on the East uh, because that's where there's been a, you know, what was erstwhile known as the Bimaru state and the R got dropped out. So it's all now basically East, you know, <clears throat> uh, Bihar, Jharkhand, uh, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, uh, West Bengal. And sadly, Assam has got added to that rather than, uh, you know, remaining the bucolic Northeast that it was. Uh, and the other point you made was about uh, rationalizing the, you know, the, the energy sector uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, so I, I 
wanted to ask you one more question though Arvind. since you worked on <clears throat> the whole issue of uh, human resources the skill resources and you know from the time the the new skill framework and the whole ecosystem was created 2009 10 there's been you know a fair amount of progress there's a lot more to be done uh, but there has been a lot of progress but there is the other sector which harsh mentioned you know the natural resource base the jal jangal zameen zameen including the soil which actually now needs massive amount of reinvestment you know uh, uh, we basically degraded this you know productive infrastructure for livelihoods could you apply some of the same kind of innovative financial thinking that you had applied first to infrastructure first to industrial development then to infrastructure development then to human resource development in the skill sector can we do it in the natural resources sector and harsh i'm going to come back after arvin answer that to you as also on the same issue well yes most certainly one can i mean most certainly one can uh, it would be a little more difficult because uh because of this natural uh, resistance of the people because they believe that anything different is likely to upset the equilibrium and therefore you see always a resistance by the people in the agriculture sector whenever we are talking of reforms but i am sure that there is this is this is not going to be an, i'll give you a simple example for instance we were talking of land uh, and i was talking of urbanization earlier now we have had this whole huge problem from uh, 40 years ago acquiring land seemed like a child's play you could go and acquire any land and give form compensation and people accepted and they accepted that the state had the right to acquire land but today you can't even acquire land for railways you can't acquire land for roads because there is a huge amount of resistance for people to give for common purposes also to give land and uh, and the compensations have become humongous therefore the cost of infrastructure has also become difficult consider it this way industrial land why is it that we need to give land for 99 years lease for industry when the life cycle of any project is not more than 30 years so what if you we start looking at reforming the land uh, the use of land in a manner in rajasthan for instance we did something very interesting which was we allowed the lands of the farmers especially the unirrigated land because rajasthan is very large number of unirrigated lands for them to give these on lease for solar power without having to convert the land use yes and then after 30 years or 20 or 30 years the land will revert to the owner and remain agricultural land now this this is a, a an innovation in land use because all the time we were talking about conversions and in then the lease has to be of a different type and then the government will give the lease and it was a messy affair what if we were to do the same thing for industrial purposes what we were to say that you can aggregate aggregation companies can come in aggregate lands of the farmers but the farmers do not alienate their right on the land they just give it for lease for 30 years for putting in industry and after 30 years when your life is over you remove your uh, you know kind of construction and remove your machinery and let the land be back with the owner and for 30 years they earn a lease rent on this as they would have a, and you know so if you have unirrigated not very productive land you can use this in a different way so there are different ways of similarly for forestry i mean even in forestry today the problem is if i want to do social forestry you require wood but the the rules laws governing social the forest i mean commercial forestry i'm sorry not social forest commercial forestry if i want to do commercial forestry on my land i want to grow trees and sell them for commercial purposes it is next to impossible because although there are rules which permit you to do so but the process of verification and then once you are transporting the certification and the forest department certification is complex so what is happening is it is easier to go and cut trees in the forest area and pay bribes and steal the wood but then do a commercial activity in terms of growing the wood and selling it for purposes of say paper making or even uh, furniture and so on so i think we need to begin to look at that it is possible to do that 
uh, it's not impossible at all. Let, let me turn to Hirsch. <clears throat> Hirsch, as Chairman Nabad, you had, uh, uh, you know, several programs where you were funding uh, natural resource regeneration. Of course, at a pirate level through the UPNRM, <clears throat> you know, uh, but uh, when the, uh, but through the Rural Infrastructure Development Fund, a uh, lot of irrigation programs was made. But the fact is that irrigation programs do not add to the net availability of water. You know, the water resources crisis in India is the fact that we are letting too much of our rainfall just flow into the sea. And that requires a different kind of investment, you know, and which has longer gestation, which has lots of externalities. It's not possible to you know, get the benefit uh, exactly in the same landmass where the investment was made, you know, all the complexities of watershed management. So particularly starting with water, but also uh, zameen and jungle, and then also uh, uh, urja, you know, energy, the issue that Arvin mentioned. What are your thoughts on how do we bring private capital into these without making it, you know, bringing in the exploitative tendencies of private capital, which is what a lot of the agitations about. Uh, <clears throat> I would say uh, two things in this regard, Vijay. Uh, broadly, two things. One is uh, uh, the private part, which you said, capital part. And the second is structured finance from within the government. You see, government at a particular point of time is constrained uh, for resources, uh, be it state or the center. Uh, I think when uh, I was there, we, with the Ministry of Finance, we were able to devise a number of ways to ensure that upfront there is a developmental effort. Impetus is given to that. So we raise resources from the market for uh, these areas. And uh, since the, the revenue charges or the earning is not there uh, to incentivize states and others to take it up, we provided some subvention. So this year's budget would be a nominal amount, but it will be spread over the years as, as and when the revenues come. And uh, probably we also need models where uh, once this process, when the irrigation comes, then uh, probably the who pays for irrigation uh, development uh, region? How, how, how do we reap it back over the years? So we need models for that also. So we had this uh, uh, this government's initiative, Har Khet Ko Pani, more crop per drop. So we had funds for that. We raised it from the market. I think uh, uh, if you look at Nabat's balance sheet today, uh, rather than RIDF, the, uh, we are going to cross uh, the other infrastructure uh, initiatives. It has already crossed 1 lakh crores. So uh, uh, this holds huge potential and each budget nominal amount goes, although the borrowing uh, subsequently has to be repaid uh, to the uh, people. So that's one way. For the private part, I would say that, uh, I mean, for this also, they, you require some kind of a relaxation in borrowing of the states. That's what we're going to see because the, the fiscal space available to states is going to be a little less in this area. But uh, largely it is going to be a governmental effort. I have no, no doubt. Second part is for the private people to come in. I think we need a better uh, bond market, first of all, a deeper bond market for people uh, where the investors uh, with the deep pockets and longer appetite can come in and invest. That's number one. Secondly, uh, this entire gamut of impact finance uh, requires very adequate measurement tools. You know, I am ready to give money. But what happens to my money? I am ready to, so we require newer inst uh, instruments, for instance, development impact bonds, DIBs can be popularized. Similarly, uh, uh, you know, we, we, lead, we require every state, at least uh, uh, some uh, organizations to, of credibility to measure impact, which is not happening today. I, I'm ready to put in, uh, uh, even if 100 rupees or 1,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees on the table, provided I know that this is going to be impact of what I have to do, in addition to the tax which I've already paid. So there are people who, who, who can put this up. So new instruments, good measurement uh, for attracting and reforms within the capital markets to, to ensure that the money flows in. The traditional way uh, we used to have the post office savings and they used to be uh, used by the uh, 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 
that has become almost like a general finance not a, uh, it has to be targeted effort for uh, private uh, uh, money to flow in rather than a generalized way of saving and channelizing there so that's my thought uh, we also requires uh, uh, newer organizations with governance focus on them you know we should start rating uh, the institutions in rural areas that governance wise this is a rated this is b rated this is c rated so this is a new kind of uh, thing which is required this will attract the people to come in and say yeah hey look at this there is a triple a uh, rural uh, livelihood creating entity in this area so why should i not uh, in addition to finance vijay i have been uh, i mean i have number of times i have said that uh, you know we have uh, annual action plans we have for the district we have annual credit plans for the district we have no annual or or a long term human resource plan for a district or for a region now it is very important uh, unless we know our endowments well how are we going to deploy in which kind of livelihoods it's impossible and the traditional way of uh, you know polytechnics working the way they were working they have to upgrade to newer courses newer skill sets required you know uh, Uh, you know mobile repairing is is fast catching on is there any short term duration course for mobile repair you know it's private entrepreneur i mean one learns in a shop but there is no 15 days course in a polytechnic or iti for that uh, we don't have uh, uh, micro irrigation pump sets being repaired tractor repair you know we have a mechanical engineering program being done there. so the kind of institutions require what uh, dr arvin mayram was saying uh, i fully agree with that that there should be a private participation in existing uh, uh, this thing even for health you look at it health infrastructure deficit was largely felt in when we had the covid and we require investment therein we have uh, in down south uh, i am i'm familiar to that some of uh, this manipal institution mangalore district center district hospital is being managed by the private uh, uh, medical college students so can we not involve in some of the phcs uh, some of the private medical colleges and they take care of performance measurements be defined uh, there'll be proper documentation of what they are doing and impact measurement happens and then see people will uh, love to invest there that's my strong feeling uh, sir uh, if you allow me vijay just four five things uh, uh, i come from a rural area sir and i strongly feel there is a lack of opportunities now if this lack of opportunities has to be overcome for people to stay there as dr arvind mayram was saying that uh, there shouldn't be large scale migration i mean uh, it creates problems for our area. so i feel uh, you know i have seen changes in rural area greening is almost not there so i have seen the green cover uh, going away so effort which is a uh, uh, more structured effort in terms of outcomes and finance be, uh, be prepared uh, models can be there water conservation itself you know we from nabard we created those those uh, water watershed uh, development projects as pilots from our side with grant assistance and partly subsequently also second phase with some loan assistance uh, nominal loan assistance but we wanted governments to take it up or communities to take it up that has not happened i think we require a massive effort on water conservation if the greening has to take place which offers opportunities for livelihoods can we have uh, the the uh, uh, the water volunteers jo humne ek bar prayas kiya tha ki kuch samay ke liye jab summers hoti hain community attention on water is the maximum when may may june july and then it 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 fades from uh, uh, monsoon onwards so during that time can we rejuvenate our traditional water bodies Thanks. and uh, that can be taken care of uh, uh, health hygiene uh, in addition to that uh, rural infrastructure we also have huge problem of drug abuse i am seeing around my place lot of de addiction centers coming up they are unprofessionally managed punjab also has a severe such problem i think uh, we need to define livelihoods for the future in a different way based on the region's requirement that's what i'm saying 
Thank you. Uh, Arvin, uh, uh, we are in the last three, four minutes of the session. Uh, while both of you have covered a lot about <clears throat> agriculture, infrastructure, and industry, you know, a large part of our GDP as well as our uh, employment is in the services sector. Now, the services sector is very bimodal. On the one hand, we have, you know, the, the world's largest, most valuable IT company, TCS, and we are the world's software leaders and all of that. On the other hand, the vast majority of so-called service sector jobs is basically carrying head loads in transport yards and construction work and all of that. What can be done to make service sector jobs more uh, sort of uh, acceptable and more, uh, you know, more remunerative to a, a significant number of the people who work there? Actually, excellent question. The, but this is a struggle. Again, this is a struggle where we carry a lot of ideological baggage. Uh, if you recall, there was this huge uh, discussion on whether we should allow FDI in retail. And uh, this, this went on for a while and we said it will take away mom and pop shows. I could never, shops, I could never understand if you allow uh, big companies like Reliance and others to come into retail, how are they different from Walmart is was something I couldn't figure out. Because if we were to say we don't want big companies, is retail is a one part of it. But we don't want foreign big companies, but we are ready to have, you know, domestic big companies was something which I couldn't figure out. But the point here is that the retail and the growth in retail has been tremendous in the last few years. And most young people, in fact, Harsh would know, but you know, young boys and girls say from Rotak or young boys and girls from say a uh, place like Dosa in, in Rajasthan or uh, Rajgarh in Alwar district would, would love to go and work at, on the shop floor of a mall because they wear proper clothes. So they may be 10th pass or 11th pass, but they would work there because it gives them a certain level of dignity rather than going and working uh, in the field or working, you know, doing a rickshaw, flying a rickshaw, etc. So the retail explosion in, in, in retail has given this, uh, this particular segment of people who are first generation moving from even from poverty into lower middle class or from rural to urban areas, they, this, is a, uh, this is one of the stepping stones for moving into higher levels of jobs, uh, which is the retail part of it. And I think we need to continue to develop retail, which is now flowing. And I'm seeing small malls coming up in, in village, I mean, large villages, I would say. They, they, they would be a type of a shop where you could walk in and pick up your own stuff and there'd be people walking around telling you how, what, what to take or not take. And they wear some sort of a uniform, like a white shirt and a black trouser, and they look smart. And they're all kids from uh, villages or, uh, you know, from different, uh, different areas. You know, under the National Skill Development uh, NSDC, which you had mentioned, and uh, basically part of the National Skill Development mission, which we had put together in 2007-8. The whole idea was to uh, provide a certain level of formalization to training, even in retail, for instance. And we found uh, the other part, which I, I would like to mention when I was saying about private sector coming, coming in, the entire model of NSDC was for them to provide incentive to private sector to make training itself as a profit center. So you train people, you charge a fee from them, which government was paying mostly through a large number of its programs, but they were then to a standard with a skill a sector skill council, which would lay out standards and how the training will be done. Three months training, two months training, six months training, certification, but third party certification so that you would have a certain quality to the certificate which they they and they, it had a port portability in the sense that then that certificate could take you to different jobs uh in that in that particular sector this all has been introduced and this is why i have seen i can tell you from my personal experience one of the maids who used to work with us from orissa kalahandi district when i was in uh, when, the, uh, when i was secretary she was living in our house and cooking food for us had five uh, five uh, daughters 
very poor. Uh, they were very, very poor people. And then I got three of his, her daughters to be trained by under one of these program training programs, because they were really poor from the rural areas. And one of them got a job. She's now with H and M in uh, cannot place uh, showroom. She goes there, dresses nicely. She gets a certain amount of uh, coupons to buy her clothes. The other one is with uh, this uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, and uh, and the third one is in, in in a similar kind of uh, area. They are all earning fourteen to fifteen thousand rupees a month. No, it's not, I mean, considering from the level from which they came after doing 10th or 12th or you know class they have all gotten into these retail kind of jobs which is giving them an upward mobility the family itself now has refrigerator and a television and all kind of things which is such a happy thing to see so you have this transformation which can take place and i in my mind retail is going to be the backbone for this transformation from uh, the from poverty up to the to you know kind of moving up above the poverty line etc and we need to do, give a lot of focus to this and skilling of people and having it more organized rather than uh, just telling people to go and stand in a shop and do you know sell goods there thank you so much uh, i want to <clears throat> end by uh, by just repeating something which harsh mentioned only in passing but it it's something that made me sad and you know uh, that in spite of 50 years of work in this sector, you know, that on the one hand, uh, the rural areas are no longer green and the other, they are getting filled with de-addiction centers. You know, we have to think about what we've ended up doing with this model. And we need to collectively <clears throat> work towards ensuring that this decade, the decade 21 to 30, actually breaks those old paradigms, many of the constraints, institutional and other constraints, mindset constraints that Arvind mentioned, for example, those need to be broken. And we need to build on the great strengths, some of the great programs that we've developed, uh, you know, as a, as a nation, whether it is uh, the Amul uh, model in the dairy sector, whether it is the self-help group model in the, in the uh, unorganized uh, worker sector, whether it is uh, you know, the, uh, the Narega program, which has been the backbone for, uh, for those who have no other work. Uh, but also a lot of breakthroughs in the modern sector, uh, all the way, as I mentioned, in the software sector. Uh, how is it, what can we do to bring the best of India for most of India? With that, I'd like to thank both of you for participating in this. Of course, we could have, as Vipin who's sitting next to me, he said this could have gone on for another few hours, but you know, we have another session and the people are waiting. Thank you so much, Erwin. Thank you so much, Harsh. And thank you very much, audience. Bye-bye. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you very much. Thank you.